Dear guests, dear audience, appreciated friends of the Venice Biennial 2022. On behalf of Wiener Zeitung, the oldest still existing newspaper of the world, I have the great honor and pleasure to welcome you to our second edition of the discussion series Opera Aperta, which is part of the major exhibition Personal Structures here in Venice. Opera Aperta is a cooperation between the University of Applied Arts, the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna, the European Cultural Center, and the Wiener Zeitung. The overall objective of the Opera Aperta series is to position and strengthen Austria as an excellent country for education of artists and creative professionals to highlight its pioneering role in developing and opening up to infinite effects of arts. The evening tonight is dedicated to a very, very huge topic. It's called Art and Social Impact, Artistic Creation and its Social Effectiveness. First of all, we begin with a musical intervention, a live act, with the goal of creating a unique crystallization point in the approach to the topic. Ruth Matthäus Bär, she is the creator, she is the initiator. I want to thank you very, very much for everything you did for us. I would like to hand over now to this very special first project this intervention. This will be made with the University of Music of Performing Arts Vienna with three musicians. First, piano, Agnes Haider. Second, saxophone, Andreas Brogner. Welcome. Drums, Raphael Foraba. Dear Ruth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am artist and researcher from the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. I will now do a reenactment of an artwork I've been doing related to arts and dementia, how we can engage with arts to dementia. And what will I do now? I will think about confused situations in my life, and you will see how interdisciplinary relation can start. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much for this impressive artwork, as you say. I hope that you got the message. Now, I want to hand over to the moderator of the evening, Georg Rusecker. He is from the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna, and George is responsible for the transfer center of the Austrian, of the Viennese universities. That's a platform to promote vivid and transdisciplinary exchanges between science, business, and society. He's an international expert and manager, and he is, last but not least, the curator of Opera Aperta. Dear guests, my dear friends, hope you enjoy the evening. I wish you an interesting and exciting experience here. George, the floor is yours. Thank you, Wolfgang. And hello, good evening to all of you. I'm very happy that we meet the second time here in Venice to reflect about art and social impact. I'm very happy that uh, the room is also filled with experts, participants, friends and colleagues who are actually have been working the last days with us together on the topic. So maybe if you ask yourself why there is an empty seat next to me, this empty seat is, so to say, the open space for the participation. But first of all, I want to kind of welcome the two panelists of today, which is Ruth Matthäus Bär. Ruth is an artist, scientist, social designer, full professor at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, head of the Center for Didactics of Art and Interdisciplinary Education. She focuses on artistic research, design research, interdisciplinarity, art and design in education, humanity, climate care, well-being, and in the field of health. And second of all, I want to welcome Heinrich, Heinrich Kova. He's a molecular biologist, professor, and group leader at the St. Anna Children's Cancer Research Institute, CCRI, in Vienna. He was the scientific director of CCRI from 2001 to 2017, which is quite a long time, actually. Basic and translational research on the pathomechanisms of childhood cancer, which is his field of expertise. So, by this means, I want to invite you to give a short opening statement. So, what is your perspective on art and social impact, which we already heard, uh, which is a very broad topic and can go in different dimensions of discussion and organization. So we would be very curious to hear from you, and maybe starting with Ruth Matthäus Bär, to explain a little bit what is your pathway to this topic of art and social innovation. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, good evening. What is the impact of art? The impact of art or the social impact of art is that we can ask ourselves if it's important to make l'art pour l'art, art just for ourselves, or if we should have some responsibility. So, for example, um, art can shake up, cross borders, can point out grievances, make people concerned. I totally believe that art has this responsibility. And what is very important to me is that art allows to think about different mindsets, so it's um, actually practice, practicing flexibility. And when you engage with arts, I can give you also um, an example that, for example, uh, one of um, our students recently finished her master program on the topic of people who have consequently uh, really pains. And she could prove that actually through art intervention, you can you can help people uh, to get in a better status of well-being. And I think this is something very essential. And also the World Health Organization, for example, uh, believes that, or it's actually proven that art can improve the well-being of people. And in our Arts and Dementia project, for example, we found out that actually when there is no medication possible, at least through the arts, we can improve the life of people. Thank you very much for this opening statement. Maybe we follow on with Heinrich Hoer. Yes, so 
in the context of, of today's evening, um, considering so, uh, social impact in the, in the context of health and well-being. And to me, health and well-being is very much linked to our ability to navigate our own life actively navigate our own life, to keep control over our own life. If we are suffering from a severe disease, like cancer, for example, or a neurodegenerative disease, or any other kind of disability, uh, this ability is greatly reduced. Navigation requires kind of roadmaps, and roadmaps in the context of what will be the next step what follows after A? Where is B? How to get to B? Yes? Uh, we as scientists, we believe that we can supply such roadmaps based on prior knowledge, based on empiry, on our, only, our own experiments, our own experience. Um, and we're generating patterns. In an essence, we want to have a pattern that we can recognize again and again and again, a repeating pattern that can be reproduced, right? Uh, like we had a workshop yesterday uh, on, on science and art, art and science, uh, and I, I, I brought the, the example of standing on a bridge in Amsterdam, looking at the next bridge over the same channel, we know how to get from this bridge to the next bridge. Very, sim very easy, just follow the road next to the channel, or maybe a parallel road, but we will get there. Doing the same thing in Paris, the same pattern will apply. London, the same pattern will apply. If you go to Venice, the pattern doesn't work anymore. And I think this is exactly what we have in complex diseases, like neurodegenerative diseases, cancer, and when you draw this just a few minutes ago, oops, I don't know whether I can get it, the balloon, right? So that's a pattern that is very difficult to reproduce, right? And I think this is exactly what the role of art here is. It gives us a different perspective. It provides us with different patterns. And it allows us to understand that patterns may not be rigid, they may be flexible, and we need a different view on them. Thank you very much. This is quite a lot, what we have heard already. And I think uh, thanks as well, bringing in this special situation why we are sitting here in Venice and uh, what kind of special environment it gives as well to sit here in this uh, palazzo and to work together on different topics and on different projects. And I mean, it is really great to see how trans and interdisciplinarity can work on specific frameworks. And I, I like this metaphor of uh, being bridged because it doesn't mean that you can connect everything. It means you have a way of being connected with a certain topic or with a certain approach or focus. And by this means, since you both come from very specific fields, like artistic research, artistic intervention, didactics and education, so child cancer research, um, for me, it would be, and I guess as well for the audience and as well for the people on the stream, it would be quite interesting to see what is your pathway, your orientation within this huge universe of social impact. What would be your way in that and what is your profile in that? That would be interesting maybe as a first question context. May I start to answer? Sure. Yeah. I would like to show you something. When I start as an artist, I start to do something. So, for example, we were discussing about cells yesterday and about tumor cells. And by doing things, questions come up into my mind. So I started to ask Heinrich, what actually happens with, um, with cells? Uh, do they stick together? And what does it mean that they stick together? What kind of liquid is this? Is this a good liquid or a bad liquid? to say so, so uh, questions arise by doing arts and not by just talking about art. And um, the approach actually is that, that we try to have different kind of projects where they're highly interdisciplinary between 
um, St. Anna Children Cancer Research Institute, for example, we collaborate with the University of Vienna, we collaborate with um, uh, the University of Music and Performing Arts, we collaborate with different experts, and we try to find new ways, or also with uh, Grisner Stadl, um, to find new ways of finding solutions. And I liked very much when you started to say about plan A and B, because actually, what can you learn through the arts? Through the arts, you can learn um, to, to find new ways of solutions. For example, you have a problem, or you have to make decisions. If you're doing a painting, you have to make decisions where to stop or where to continue. Um, and also, in, in, in design, Projects, for example, you have to find out, okay, if plan A does not work, you already think about plan, plan B, C, D, E, F. And this makes you an expert in designing and also in the arts. So through arts, you can learn and through design thinking, for example, you can learn and practice to engage. But what is the special thing of art? Art teaches you empathy because you need to be curious, you need to be interested in other people to get involved with them and to, to get to know them better. And therefore, for example, we had experiences in different kind of models. So one of the projects, for example, what I learned is that we actually engaged and were focusing on the process through science and arts. And only afterwards, we started to share the impact with the, the, the the audience, the public, of our outcomes to better understand what actually science is about, how to understand the outcomes of science. But I guess there, yeah, there are different kind of approaches. So it is also possible to talk about some kind of co-learning or co-experience within this field and seeing it from a different angle. How is it from your perspective, Heinrich Kova? Yes, so I'm a scientist, right? <laughs> so we as scientists, we try to establish facts. And we do so by observation, by measurements, in essence, using different kinds of methods. And I cannot recall the exact wording, but I would like to cite Ludwig Wittgenstein, uh, who in his Tractatus said that in, this is the, the, the contents, right? It's different wording, but in, in essence he said that you see, you watch through your eyes, but you don't see your eyes. And the eyes are not, the par not part of your visual field. And so in essence, you see not what your eyes see, but you see what you dream, okay? So I was very excited today. We had a workshop this, this morning uh, on, on the development of an app for patients, uh, for patients who undergo bone marrow transplantation, heavily immunosuppressed patients, uh, and about getting them involved to express their feelings, to express their, and to, and to, to, to measure also their activity, and so forth, and uh, the different participants who are mostly here in the room uh, contributed different ways, drawings, and things like that. And one of them was this one over here. So I show this one here, uh, which was actually one that was drawn to illustrate anger. But if you look at it exactly, what you will see is an eye. And so the eye is something which is very important for us. It stands for us not only for seeing, but all kinds of senses, right? Whether this is hearing, smelling, watching, whatever it is, these are our senses. And so many things that we don't understand, that's my, my approach as, an art, as, as a scientist to it, is what art is doing it's appealing to our senses. It's, it's, it's doing something which is in our dreams. It goes through our senses. It may be different between you and you, to, between me and you and you, yes? Uh, but it's a different kind of approach. It's appealing to our senses, and it makes us, coming back to the, to the pattern that I was indicating before, 
it gives us a different kind of pattern. And as soon as we recognize a pattern, like for example, recognizing an, an eye in this drawing, we feel somehow comfortable. So yeah, that's my approach to it. Does this answer your question? Yeah, basically I think we are very happy now to get a little bit of insight how artistic methods or as well interpretation could help us to maybe solve or question things differently, coming to other conclusions. And as I can see, Ruth Matthias Bear is holding a little bottle in her hand. What do you want to show us? I want to show you something. Smell works directly to our limbic system. We cannot say what is influencing us. All of a sudden, we are in a special mood, influenced maybe by a special smell. So this is also about knowledge of our body and mindset and memory of our body. And we cannot actually calculate what is happening. It's very intuitive, but intuition is actually a knowledge, a tacit knowledge of our body. So artistic research is believing in intuition. This is actually a good point to pick up this uh, experience level, which you both pointed out in different ways. Um, as an observer from the outside, sometimes it raises the question, I mean, art and science is around said quite a long time, and actually this new focus on also well-being and uh, trying to connect uh, with maybe elderly people, children, people who have diseases. I am, how is it actually to work together in terms of language, in terms of uh, understanding each other and learning from each other? Is this always a super easy part? Or would you say that there is also some quite long development done yet? Because this is around since a couple of decades. So would you say that this is getting through um, a common goal, a common understanding with practices and different methods, it's getting better in a sense, or it's getting more contingent? I believe that actually this interdisciplinary approach is very, the word is very abused and very often used, but what does it mean? I, actually, we had a lot of fun in one of our projects where we figured out we had to laugh so much because actually we did not understand each other. So the informatic designer told us something, or the game designer, and in medicine or in arts, we said, what did you say? So we started actually to have a kind of a dictionary. We started to engage and write down all the words because we did not understand what you were talking about and what kind of short words you use or for interpretation, and you understand each other, but we did not have any idea. So I think interdisciplinary work, and actually this is a quotation from a, from a, medic, from a physician, a medical doctor, who said that actually interdisciplinary starts, or you can talk actually the first time about interdisciplinarity, if you manage to translate your own thoughts and, and approaches into the language of somebody else. So this is something very special. You cannot just say, I work interdisciplinary, because we can both work on a topic, but you stay in, in medicine or in molecular biology, and I stay in, in arts. But when we start to be curious what you want to find or what is important to you, I need to have curiosity and motivation, then we can engage and find uh, to each other. And um, I think this is very important um, regarding interdisciplinarity and especially here in Venice, um, so many different groups and expertises met so we could discuss uh, various topics. Um, for example, um, of how to engage or how to collaborate or how can we solve a special issue. And I guess this is uh, the most important thing on interdisciplinary approaches. Mm. How is it, is it with you? I mean, uh, the most challenging part is talking the same language, explaining to each other what you mean, and actually, even more, finding out that your partner understands something completely different from what you are saying, using the same words, for example. Right? But here, I think, it's maybe a very basic 
artistic <laughs> practice then is using metaphors, which help a lot, right? Uh, so when we, in, we had a project together with Root and a number of people also here in the audience, uh, uh, which was called Art for Science, and here it was about scientists explaining to artists what they are doing, and the artists being inspired by the explanations and creating something that would help others to understand what the scientist is doing, yes? And I think we spent most of the time really just about getting to the same language, yes? And it is very, very exciting and interesting, just this discussion, because you're, you're used, you're so much caught in your own environment, you're using the same types of words and phrases and, and uh, 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 definitions again and again over years, you don't question them anymore. But now you have somebody uh, talking to you who, who's challenging you because the person has a different view on it. And it makes you think and it makes you being more accurate or maybe redefine uh, the different definitions, the different words and things like that. So I think this is a, in itself a very creative and a very exciting experience. Yeah, that fits well actually to set in the morning. Challenge and as well the urgency. We see the world is kind of drifting apart. Societies are not so connected anymore, especially through catastrophes and ideas of what we actually see. I think my microphone has died. <laughs> and by this means, I'm. How does this urgency as well puts on the one hand maybe some pressure, but also brings people together in cooperation or collaboration in the arts, science, but also in this vision of how could, um, in a way, social impact create the impact on a positive side, a positive side on people, how sociality is understood and how society can benefit from this kind of corporations. After we have heard now that uh, somehow the disciplines sorted out to speak each other with each other through different form of metaphors, pictures, and we have a lot of technological assistance here. Uh, how could that be possible as well to give a little bit of a future vision of where can we really enhance or in a way help people in this terms of well-being and uh, care, caretaking, not only between people, also between the relation to the planet we are living on. <laughs> Me? The ones. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, I think it's uh, maybe the, the way of, of, the, of the mindset. What I really like to also to refer to is the sentence of Karen Barab, the existence is not an individual matter or affair. And this also relates to our exhibition at Palazzo Mora in uh, number 18, where many, many people investigated their um, artworks. And what it means actually is when you can, can imagine that, for example, we can talk about climate change and caring for trees. Um, but then it's something like, okay, here is the tree and here am I and I take care of for the tree. But if you understand it right, it's like the tree and me, we are related. And when we are related, we have a different form of responsibility. And this form of responsibility we owe to society. And this is a totally different way of approach. And um, this is something I think is very important. And I think the, impa the impact is maybe different in how we we, how the impact can be explained. Uh, because, of course, we don't know all the time if something is changing uh, through artwork, but at least maybe because you engage with, because you cooperate, you co-create, you collaborate together with others, something new comes into existence, I guess. Yes, so I think... Uh impact or social impact is generated whenever an individual makes contact to other individuals, be one or more, tens, hundreds, 
and connect to those individuals as soon as there's a connection, right? And this connection can be, can take different forms, of course, yes? It can be, because we're talking a lot about well-being, right? It can be something that is comforting, but it can also be something which is just disturbing, provoking, uh, 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 causing uh, uh, conflict, uh, and so forth, which in itself contributes to well-being because it raises attention to something, uh, a, a patient, for example, who cannot express herself, himself, uh, about their feelings, about their, their anxieties, about their distress, uh, and getting the, the attention for it, yes, uh, using different means, and this can be artistic means, drawing something, uh, but whatever the means are, right, uh, makes impact, impact on the ones that are confronted with it, to whom the person is connecting. Is this answering the question? It's answering the question in a way, but it also shows the focus because now you made a drift. Now you said something which art is quite famous for, not just uh, pleasing or showing up that art is just beauty. For sure it is aesthetics, it is beauty. But it also shows in history, and this is what you said, Ruth, that basically there is also an observation framework, and normally the observation framework is history. It means you have to look back that you see when something started. A societal movement, for example, very often was initiated by artists or artistic thinkers, and nobody was actually taking care about that. But then, years later, it came to a somehow impact, and then it's the storytelling, the question. Who is telling the story? Was the art so to say, the impact giver, or was it also someone who just had a thought and connected it to others? But what you also mentioned, and I think is important to point out again, is that the role can also be a very critical one. It can um, take the place, this, the freedom of art, I want to subsume here, that uh, art can do something in this secured space which wouldn't be possible maybe under a normative rule, under a, under a law. And I mean, this is also a free space which gives people the chance to kind of experiment. As we are here talking about social impact, I mean, there, are, there is a lot of social pressure out there. And uh, especially in these troubling times, I would say that social impact becomes maybe a new form. So do you see that at the moment, the projects are you working in, um, contributing to this kind of, I wouldn't say it's a paradigm shift because this is too heavy, but would you see that there is also kind of a twist or a shift within the work you are doing since the last decades or years um, that you observe that maybe more people are interested in something like that? Or you get a better voice within society that people say, yeah, that's really something which is a fundamental element of human beings which should be cared of. Well, um, in our workshop uh, this morning, actually, one of our colleagues um, said that uh, very important is that art takes you to a flow, first time quoted by and Mihaly, and this flow is actually, what, what is a flow? A flow is that you are in the here and now, and this is actually also the topic of the European Culture Center from the Venice Biennale, which talks about um, time, space, existence, and this means also, what does it mean to be in the here and now? And to give you an example, in our project uh, about art and dementia, uh, actually I learned that people with uh, cognitive impairments, let's say dementia, um, that they actually know the totally presence. They know if you are one second looking at your mobile phone or you are not attentive, but actually we are not used anymore. We are all the time, we are somewhere else. And they teach you, they force you, because if they realize that you are not with them, um, they stop their attention to you. And I think this is really very interesting that we can learn from them um, this absolute presence. And you can go to the Palazzo Mora, and there is a movie about that, and you can test yourself if you manage, and I'm just talking about two minutes, if you manage just two minutes to give the full attention to a person 
and not being ab um, abstracted somewhere um, else. And I think this is something we can learn. Yes, I mean, I think it's, uh, in science, I would wish there would be already a, a paradigm shift <laughs> in this context. Uh, specifically working in a field where progress, where we have a lot of progress in our basic understanding, like cancer research, basic understanding of the molecular underpinnings of a disease. And that's true for many diseases due to the, to the fascinating uh, technical developments of the last decades or even last years, even last months, if you like. Uh, but still, we're not progressing in terms of impact so fast as we would like to see it. Mm. And uh, I definitely think that it needs, again and again, methods and approaches that make you think out of the box. And definitely uh, having interactions like we had uh, in the context of these workshops, in the context of the four projects that we're rep representing here, uh, helps you thinking out of the box. It doesn't precipitate immediately into an impact. I mean, that's, it's always like that. Even when we do science, you always ask, so how can, what can you do now better for the patients that you couldn't do before, right? It takes a lot of time. But I think uh, uh, in a time where uh, generally we're speeding up so much, we're always running like crazy, uh, we need to get our funds, we need to be competitive, we need to publish, uh, things like that. It needs a space that allows you to think out of the box. And definitely, as soon as you involve your senses, and art, I can only repeat myself, is appealing to your senses, helps you thinking out of the box. And so this is something I would like to see more frequently, I would say. Perfect association, out of the box, into the seed, as I promised, Basically, we are looking into the audience and somebody actually gave me a sign that he or she, in this sense, wants to raise a question. I, you can take the microphone, it's already there. I think my microphone is working again. So please, introduce yourself and tell us what you want to know. Thank you for the invitation, thanks. Uh, my name is Anita Lavitschka. I am from the St. Anna Children's Hospital. I am a transplanter and a scientist or researcher. And um, what I would like to add to uh, the, the statement up front is that we have seen that um, art and artesian practices um, did make uh, a change. Uh, they improved the education and the communication between the patients, their families, and their medical teams. Um, furthermore, the, um, through methods of design uh, thinking and partici uh, participatory design, which involved the patients directly, uh, we, we have seen that the engagement of the patients during the cor course of disease, during the course of illness and transplantation, uh, was uh, enhanced during a follow-up uh, um, of six months and 12 months. And um, what was really um, added to data which are already published, um, we have seen that the adherence to treatment, to medication, improved through those methods. So I would say... Um, Art was really able to enhance, improve self-empowerment and self-engagement of the patients. Um, but I would like uh, to ask a question to um, the panel. Um, how would you define or how would you describe impact? <laughs> You want to start so first? Please. Well, if I start, <laughs> that's a difficult question. One. That's a really difficult. <laughs> that's a really difficult one, of course. But I mean, as I said, I think impact is there as soon as as people connect immediately, right? 
as soon as, I mean, not just having contact, really connect. That means uh, giving an action and getting a reaction to it. In the simplest form, I would say. This is, to me, this is impact, right? Of course, we would like to see much deeper impact, uh, which is changing a social behavior, changing uh, 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 the outcome in, 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 in disease treatment, uh, of course. Uh, but I think this is a very ambitious goal, and it really starts first with, with communicating something, action, getting a reaction to it, and this is, I think, the start of everything. Uh, and uh, getting attention, empowerment, as you, as you mentioned before, right? I think these are the, the, major, the major forms of impact that I could think of. I think it's also the question of how you measure um, impact. I mean, of course, you could say it's evidence-based medicine, or you use the impact on such kind of outcomes. But in, with arts or through the arts, I believe that impact is, for example, if you see somebody smiling, that somebody is getting happy by doing artistic practices, this is for me already an impact. But I can tell you another story, for example, which happened in um, the Arts and Dementia Project. Uh, we had a lady um, in a very advanced uh, stadium of, of dementia, so she could not pronounce certain words or phrases, not even phrases, so you would not be able to understand her. And after one hour of collaboration with her, doing artistic practices together, she started to speak in whole sentences again. And all her care assistants were impressed because they said, we work, we collaborate with her every day, but this never happened. And this happened because of artistic practices. So I really believe in the arts that we with arts can make changements in situations. We don't know how long, but if we think about the here and now, the most important thing is to, to have an impact for people at the moment, and maybe it's not so important if it's uh, all the time, because we can discuss if we are happy all the time. I mean, you don't have to be ill. Um, many of us have different mood changes. So, I mean, just to be in a good mood uh, is already an impact which art can, can give you. And I think there is a connectedness. Or ma ma many people could, for example, manipulate themselves by listening to music, if they think about it. Because music can make you totally happy. I'm sure that... <laughs> Many people in the audience know that, or I hope they know that, because actually it's a, the best drug ever. <laughs> <laughs> Good, because this brings me what is this process or impact-driven, however you want to call this, is pretty much based on doing, is pretty much based on applying. Now it's both. It's pretty much based on applying, is on doing. So this leads me actually to my second question context. Uh, we heard now a little bit about where you're coming from. Thank you very much. Where you're coming from. And somehow we try to sort out in which kind of connection societal or social impact could be seen to your work. Second of all, now it would be in these times even more very important how to apply that to learn a, bit, a little bit more about how it could be applied in examples, for example, in projects, how it could be applied in educational frameworks or in practices who could be used in a greater societal context. I think at the moment the big question is how to transfer skills and understandings and mindsets to people who may have not heard of that before. And this is maybe also a reason why we are sitting here, and this is also why we met in Venice, to kind of create this specific moment, this secure space, as I called it before, also to discuss quite open and freely about what could be the next steps, what kind of appliance levels are you thinking about, or which kind of appliance levels or practices do you have in front of you, which you would like to give out in a greater context of social society. 
<laughs> me again. But I believe, um, especially now in times after COVID, many people have different kind of experiences and of feeling of isolation. So it's not just people with um, diverse illnesses who feel isolation. I think many people now can empathize with this situation. And thinking about that, I believe that the arts and projects through the arts can change things and also learn us different perspective taking. I mean, in, in one of the projects, um, there was this um, object created, um, which also meant how can you look at different, from different perspectives on the questions of a cell and of the um, development of metastasis, right, of, of tumor cells. So by collaborating with the arts, maybe arts does not have the impact of immediately change uh, or give you a um, horeca idea of solution, but maybe it can. Maybe it once happens that somebody postpones a question. I think you gave an example yesterday that all of a sudden we have a solution for a topic we have been researching for a long time. And I think artists have done that for a very long period. If you think about Leonardo da Vinci, um, and he was already thinking so interdisciplinary. He tried to bring things together in his mindset, and this was uh, very essential, and I think we are kind of in a new renaissance time where we need to bring the different disciplines together to solve these complex topics we are facing today. So climate change or different forms of illnesses, we don't have a very fast and easy solution. We have to find this or develop um, this complex situation from different angles, right? I guess. Yes, so I would like to mention maybe two aspects. The first one is uh, arts as a means of illustrating scientific results. Not only scientific results, I mean generally complex topics, illustrating them, making them easily graspable, easily uh, understandable. And I think, for example, I think because you mentioned the COVID situation, I think this is something that has not been sufficiently used in the communication about the whole pandemic uh, uh, disaster, <laughs> if I uh, may say that, uh, like when it comes to vaccination, things like that, because, because uh, experts have been asked, experts like scientists, right, have been asked to give their op opinion. They talk about facts, they talk about science, very difficult to understand for the for the white uh, public, right? And I think if I would have used scientific practices a lot more just to illustrate, relatively simply illustrate, what a vaccination does, for example, right? And how the virus infection works, things like that. Very simple. They don't, people don't need to understand exactly the mechanism how they are. They need to understand, they need to get a picture of it and a feeling for that. So artistic practices for illustration, I think this is something that is definitely highly needed. And the other thing is, the other aspect is our own experience from a, a collaborative project that we had with Root, uh, which for me was quite enlightening. Um, I, the, the, our, our task was that Root is producing some piece of art about metastasis about metastatic cell. We had an example, a specific pediatric tumor, which was a, a bone tumor, and Ruth was asking a lot of questions. We had all these language difficulties that you addressed before, right, to understand each other, things like that. And then she was drawing a picture of a metastatic cell, and we were talking a lot about the plasticity of, of a cell that is needed to go through all the different steps during the metastatic process and how the cell would actually manage to do that, and that there needs to be some kind of communication, and that the cell has something on its surface for getting in signals, receptors, things like that. And Ruth had her own, own uh, picture of that. And she, she produced a picture with a cell that had a lot of processes, and the processes were talking to each other. 
And when we were sitting there and I saw that, I said, well, you know, this is something that's actually happening. There are different signals that interconnect with each other to give different kinds of output, right? And then Ruth was saying, yes, but I can draw the same picture in a different color. And then all of a sudden you see different structures. And she did it like that. And it's true. It looks kind of different. Comes back to the, to the, to the, to the issue of having different perspectives. You showed this one here, uh, putting light from different sites. You will see different structures. You will understand, understand it differently. And uh, for, 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 the, for, the, for the artist, it was kind of enlightening and also, I guess, also kind of a, a, a positive uh, experience to see that actually she produced something which corresponds to what we as scientists see as the reality through our eyes that we don't see, as I said before, yes. Uh, but and for, for us, for me as a scientist, uh, it was uh, the experience of through an artistic practice coming to uh, a, 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 a mechanism, actually, right? And I, it didn't really precipitate immediately into the research that we were doing, but it definitely, I use this very frequently when I'm teaching students, when I'm talking to students, PhD students, and so forth. I'm telling them uh, about this specific experience because it broadens your horizon. Yes, getting a different perspective, coming from an artistic perspective. That is uh, helpful in a way that this multi-perspectivity and what you pointed both out. What you pointed both out is uh, that you basically had the sense of complexity. So it was as well in our workshop in the morning, complexity in a sense stays complex. It isn't reducible, but somehow we can shape it. We can try to figure out how we can connect it, as you said as well, with more people. And uh, in the morning it was quite funny because we had the idea uh, to say, can you somehow say it again, just a little bit more clear or just a little bit more simple or just try to use other words in the sense that maybe you address other people by just trying out to differently speak out, think or differently listen to stuff. And I mean, this is something now we are coming into the context of how to broaden these ideas. I mean, still, you mentioned Leonardo da Vinci, specific top person. We all know he was a genius in this sense, even if we are not kind of following this ideal of a genius anymore. But from the other way around, how can we kind of bring things in a connectable stage that more and more people can connect with these ideas, or can at least participate, or work on that, or try to understand it. And I think this is really not the other side of the spectrum. It is it needs a very sensitive approach, in a sense, to try to translate or transform this actually often quite specific knowledges, specific findings from arts and from science. How could, or maybe you have some examples at hand, um, how can we create a participatory framework and a landscape or something, let's call it a room, <laughs> a space where people can actually try this out. I mean, I have seen this uh, in the last two days and for me it was just crazy. It was really, really nice to see so many people participating which would never come together and I think maybe with your eyes from the artistic or the scientific viewpoint, what kind of potentials would you see within that kind of possibilities, I would call it? Well, I think there are different approaches. So one approach is that you do research. Um, one approach is that it, you do uh, or you engage in workshops. So we did a workshop, for example, inspired by uh, Calder to do mob Mobilis. Um, and this is about thinking about finding your own balance, but also using metaphors to express something which is important for you. Um, so we worked on a positive experience, for example. And through all these items or processes, you, you learn something. Uh, you learn by doing um, artistic practice by yourself. But what is also, I guess, important is to disseminate what you found out. So this is also engaging 
um, bringing um, information to society. For example, to talk about dementia is rather very difficult and you have to find a very simple language to explain because a cognitive impairment has been um, a pandemic situation before um, COVID and will be after COVID will, will be one of the biggest challenges. And so how can you explain, starting from children in schools who already know my grandfather is strange or my grandmother is strange. And for example, we also tried to, to make a book on the experiences um, from different uh, countries of the world, different um, protagonists. But what I think is also very interesting and, and um, important is the visual language of arts, because art has a language everybody can understand. So if you look at this book, for example, um, there is a special typo developed for explaining uh, what happens when you're um, uh, suffering of, of dementia or cognitive impairments, and also why this color is used. Um, this has all a background engaged with um, cognitive impairment and what is important. And then reading about different kind of approaches. So this is another possibility to reach uh, or ha to have a social impact in um, making workshops, engaging with citizens, engagement. Um, I think it's very important making workshops with different um, target groups, but also um, doing uh, wonderful books. Because a book is not just a scientific book with content. A book has to look nice, has to smell nice, and has to be um, very touchy. So you need to have this feeling, and then it's nice to look at it and to think about um, it and also to read it, of course. And I think this is all a special kind of impact uh, we can engage with. Engagement is um, basically a very interesting term. Engaging, what does it really mean? Feeling engaged and having this kind of motivation and joy. I mean, there was something in the morning as well we heard make people interested try to bring motivation through joy to playfulness, to really engage in a way, because you like to do things. What are actually making joy or making uh, something that you are feeling really within a social system, not just listening to somebody or reading somebody. And now this brings me to the terms of interactivity. You actually mentioned the framework, so many workshops which are going on, and sometimes you feel maybe Wow, we are doing so many workshops with different topics and different people. So this is a very specific social inclusion or maybe a social impact moment to kind of create these situations over and over again. Do you have any specific recipe? Would you actually suggest something to us in a way how you put together these projects and after what selection criteria, as you mentioned it before, what are you looking into when you uh, set up a new project or, or make a new funding scheme, uh, having an eye on social inclusion or having an eye on social impact? Well, one thing I learned also now here in these days that um, there were some people who told me that it's the first time in their life that they participated uh, at a workshop and about the experience, because you need some something like of um, curiosity, as you need to be curious, but you also need to be courageous, because maybe some people would not take part in a workshop because they might say, I don't know, I've never done this before, so maybe it's, um, maybe it's a situation for me which is not so pleasant. And so I think what you need is kind of this curiosity, um, courage, and this is, for example, what we also learned in our collaboration with our uh, colleagues from um, Murau in these days. Um, to because if you if you see that everybody is presenting him herself, everybody is doing something, then you have the feeling um, that you can engage with. And how projects come into existence, I figured out that actually. Um, you, f you try to find people f with different approaches which are interesting for your project. This is like all these projects came into existence because we tried to, to work on a different topic or on a special topic and we tried to find the people collaborating. And what I must say is all the projects we have been doing, we had fun. 
So we were laughing at all the projects. So it was hard work, many, many hours, more hours than we ever received through fundings. Um, but um, we, we learned so much from each other because we were curious to develop something. A question from the audience, and uh, please, come up to us. Für Menschen, die Beeinträchtigung ist für wichtig, zusammenarbeiten. Die Zusammenarbeit mit anderen Menschen in Venedig ist einzigartig. Frage, wie können Künstler mit Menschen mit Behinderung gleichwertig zusammenarbeiten und voneinander lernen? Und mein Name ist Leike Alexandra und komme aus Morau. Thank you very much. I will try to translate this question for you. Um, it's about, first of all, you've been telling us that this place to be in Venice and to meet other people and to work together with other people is a very unique possibility to kind of engage. And maybe a very special thing is that the equality of the meeting and how things can be done together in group works is very special. So the question would be, how can we increase the possibilities for uh, people with special needs and to get connected with artists and scientists in a deeper way? So it's about equality and how can we create an environment to meet. It fits actually quite well to what I've been also mentioning beforehand. Please, thank you very much. Design. Well, I think it's um, the, the item is, uh, which is approached here is about um, participation. Uh, it's again the same metaphor I was using before of existence is not an individual matter. Um, I think we cannot solve uh, problems alone. For example, I remember in the starting of the um, uh, informatics, um, when you imagine how a computer should work, um, people who, st who developed um, computing systems, they started to ask people, what do you need that you can interact? And actually it was very at, at the very beginning like that. And this is very crucial because if you design something um, which nobody can use, for example, if you have this little bottle, what I found out, for example, if you get older, it's very difficult sometimes to see where <laughs> the smell gets out. So when I want to take, for example, the perfume and um, everything is black, I don't know how to use it. I cannot see it. I need my glasses to put on my glasses. And, and I need to define how to use it. So I think we need to collaborate. We, we cannot say, okay, I know what you need and I design something for you. I think um, the objective is to engage collaboratively but we also have to make maybe a difference there because uh, what we learned also with uh, children um, which are, had stem cell transplantation, it's very hard for them to engage, for example, in technology when it's not really working. So you need to develop um, the technical part until a special moment so then you can um, engage and test it. And so you cannot work participatory from the beginning. But in that special situation, you need to develop something in advance. But then it's called co-design, because in very special situations, you ask them to test it. So it's a classical design thinking way that you ask people, you prototype, you develop, you empathize with the target group, you, um, you iterate, you have find several solutions, and then you, you prototype and you test. I think this is very important. Um, in many other projects, for example, what I learned the last days um, from you is I was really very nervous um, that I was asked to also to, to dance in front of so many people. I mean, we are used to dance in a 
dancing place, like in a discotheque or at a bar, um, that's fine. But it's not so common um, to me, for example, to dance in, f in the middle of uh, about 30 people. And I was really very um, well calmed down when I learned that um, people um, from, for example, in, um, in, in Griezner Stadel, they started to, to dance. And then I felt more courageous, for example. Then I thought, OK, I, I can, OK. When they start, I also need to be courageous and show that I can do it. And then um, I found out that I developed something different, which helps me or learns, teaches me something. And this is also what I need. I think we need to to bring into education this interdisciplinary approach, and then also to teach this very social um, important items like um, the social skills of saying please, saying thank you, um, applauding, celebrating success, um, all these special details I think are very important. Um, maybe I want to give you, Heinrich Kova, also the chance to uh, reflect on the question because there is another question in the audience, but maybe you can actually yeah, very, just, just very give briefly, a quick response. Yeah. yeah, very briefly. I think it needs people who take the initiative. It takes people who are open-minded. And it needs people who take the time for it. It all starts with people who really take the initiative, open-minded, take time. Uh, and I think what you said, I mean, the interdisciplinarity has a big, big advantage, not only that different disciplines come in, but it's also coming to your, to your question, being on the same level, right, is, means you're coming from a field, nobody else, nothing can be embarrassing because nobody else understands your field better than you yourself. But each of the people in the room have their own expertise uh, and have their own uh, 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 personality and so forth. So there is no embarrassment, like you said, with the dancing, right? So you can really start just from scratch all together, but it needs somebody who says, I'm going to bring these people together. Uh, I want to do something here. Uh, and I can only say my own experience uh, when getting into the Art for Science project, for example, I was the most skeptical person in, in the group. And I didn't want to join in the beginning because it was not clear to me in which direction this is going and what it can do and so forth. But it was really the people who were already in the group who persuaded me. They came up with interesting, maybe challenging ideas which in which I couldn't shut up. I just had to say something and so forth. And that was really something that attracted me. And that's why I wanted to, to then in the end to, to contribute to it. And, and, and it was really, really rewarding. And I think this is exactly what is needed. You need people to take the initiative and, and, and motivate other people. And then I think it's just, it's just working out. I mean, we have seen this here the last two days, really working out. At an, as an equal level, meeting it's each other on equal levels of participation and exchange can maybe enrich in a very good way yes. seeing this, what we have beforehand explained as this perspective shift. Not always just like flying to the moon, having another perspective. So, but now, please, the question from the audience. Can you tell us who you are? Thank you very much. I'm from computer science, and you mentioned um, uh, collaboration in an interdisciplinary way, also with uh, informatics, computer science. Um, how important is technology in your work and how can people from computer science, for instance, uh, uh, support you in, in, your, in your work and also in interdisciplinary collaboration? I would say because um, computer science and informatics and all these toolkits which you are developing uh, can help us to interact uh, with different target groups and to reach a society. So I think actually through this um, media, um, we can reach a high impact because we can reach many people. And this for me would be, or is the, the value, the very high value and very appreciated value to collaborate with technology 
in, within um, the, the items or the topics we are working on. Actually, all kind of different approaches. I'm always coming back. And what is also very interesting to me that actually computer science has a similar language with design thinking. Also design theory is very close to computer science. And so this is interesting because you, the, the language you speak is already closer. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you understand each other fully, but it's closer and that, that's uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think, uh, as I said in the beginning, identifying patterns uh, is taking anxiety, right? Uh, as soon as you identify a pattern in a complex matter, and that can be a disease, for example, uh, you feel much better because you can somehow grasp it. And uh, computer sciences is the basis for artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is doing nothing else than uh, using patterns, patterns that we teach the computer and doing it much better and reducing the complex dimensionality to very few dimensions to make the dimensions or the, the complex pattern uh, 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 easily understandable and graspable, yes? So I think for sciences, computer science right now is very, very, very important in this respect. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, actually a fact that we cannot avoid to talk about. Uh, computer sciences, information technologies, graphical user interfaces are kind of surrounding us. So maybe there is also the role of design, as you mentioned, and art, and uh, yeah, designing things, and how can that go together? Yeah, but, uh, what is also very essential, I think, it's, it's also very interesting. For example, I remember an art class where um, the students asked me, but what do I need art education for? And then I said, okay, tell me what kind of profession you would like to have in your life. And um, I, the children could answer, so each child would start what they want to become in their life. And I tried to figure out why they would need art. And actually, I could find it to all kind of different professions. And, and one of the basics, actually, is pattern recognition. Because one, if one would say, I would like to become a pilot, I said, you will need pattern recognition to find geographic landscapes um, to get orientation. Um, I, I would like to become a physician, a medical doctor. Then I would say, you will need that, because you will need to study different illnesses or images. You need to. Um, understand um, a similarity or um, a divergence. And I think this is very crucial that um, referring to what you were saying about uh, pattern recognition, I think this is something uh, we learn through the arts besides of decision making, besides of problem solving. It's actually a tool to, to live, to learn to live. Yes. This is something I believe. Very good. This leads actually to my last question context, which is uh, more about, and we are hitting there because we have been also talking now, this is not just maybe a human state of mind. This might also need assistance within computers, codes. I mean, we are walking into a future where we are designing a total new framework of how an environment might look like, what kind of processes and what kind of interconnectedness or interrelation we will, so to say, have for our social moment. So, because if you're talking social impact, and now I'm also opening the floor a little bit for the experts here in the room and what we have been doing the, the last days, have been discussing to, let's say, collaboratively open up and say, what kind of processes, practices, and environments and safe spaces we need to meet? How important could a space or um, environment like Venice be to set up a total new step into the future to say how social impact and arts can grow out of their shoes and see how we can actually prospect the picture of the future which could be as well having a critical aspect as well I would say we are in the middle of a, a tremendous uh, change within sustainability level, levels we have war in front of our uh, in front of our borders, we have viruses, we have diseases. I mean, humans maybe have to change as well how this kind of 
connectedness could look like. And maybe I will also invite all the people in the room, maybe we can use up the last 15 minutes to reflect a little bit about what would be our vision within that thing of art and social impact. But I will invite first of you my panelists, my dear panelists, to maybe give us some input first of all. Yeah, so there are probably different aspects to it. I think one thing, uh, just learning from the experience of the last days here in Venice, is uh, you need a kind of a stimulatory environment. Uh, I mean, we discussed a lot whether we could have had this in Vienna, because most of us are from Vienna, right? Uh, but it's really the different environment here uh, that stimulated a lot of interactions here bringing the people together, but really it's, 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 this is just one aspect, bringing people together, but having an environment that is stimulating. I could imagine also uh, like we had this morning uh, in the workshop uh, what kind of, of situation would be comforting for a patient undergoing a really very difficult a period of, of her, his life, uh, and, and very frequently the different nature elements were cited, like water, flowers, trees, birds, whatever else, right? So I could imagine that, again, it's an envir environmental question, if you like, a stimulatory uh, uh, environment that could help you a lot, depending on the specific topic that you want to address in this kind of interdisciplinary space. The second definitely is it always needs funds. It always needs a certain amount of money. And for this, it needs a lot of uh, persuasiveness <laughs> uh, for people to spend money on, on that kind of, of interaction, because it's something that as I said, it's not having an immediate, an immediate precipitation, an immediate consequence. It's something that really is just changing mindsets and having a long-term uh, 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 effectiveness, right? Uh, and so that means, again, people taking the initiative and trying to get the funds for it. I think this is an important thing. Uh, then connectivity, I mean, having, uh, uh, thinking about which disciplines to involve, yes. We have been talking a lot about now drawings and, and things like that. We have not talked a lot about music or performing arts or uh, any kind of other arts, but that's definitely, again, depending probably of the, of the specific topic that may make a difference. Uh, Yes, so these would be the first things that, I, that come to my mind. Maybe you can ex expand on that. Yes, I, um, I think it's uh, what is also very important that we need to improve our perspective taking uh, because um, we get very easily in a stuck state. We have experienced this the last period of time in our politics. Uh, what is happening in this world, um, but uh, also in our countries, actually, um, that um, people stop to take different perspectives, and this is, for me, an essential approach which can um, be taught or experienced um, by the arts. So I think we need this subject that everybody gets this experience and I, yeah, so I would, would say this would be interesting. Okay, so maybe any responses in the audience? Uh, because if not, I'm actually trying to go in the direction of conclude a little bit what we have heard tonight and uh, how we kind of sailed through the different elements. So we started with the idea of what social impact and arts could be in a specific glue together. We heard about that it's actually more like a process-oriented approach than something we really can just initiate and do. And I think this is something which we could keep in mind 
if we are going out there not always just thinking big, having small impacts, as you mentioned, as a, having a smile, having joy, having the idea that your mind is shifted within a, within a setting where you have been maybe in the beginning in a critical mood. So just of, in a way, opening up uh, to something would, what could happen to you. And uh, as well, I think what is a very important thing that we, and for me this was very touching, have heard that especially the environment, the space where you can meet, um, maybe also without a goal or a first specific goal, just to meet and to exchange and in a way feel and understand each other, has a very prominent role in this whole social moment to just create space which maybe has been lost or which maybe has to be reinvented to meet different people on different levels and also to see how can I explain, how can I do what I do in different ways. So we have been talking about this perspective shift maybe in a sense of how we create how we motivate, how we educate in the future to create this specific sensitivity, what impact could be and how this could help in a sense of well-being to society. And I want to thank you very much. I also want to thank ECC uh, for this great palazzo. I want to thank the audience and everybody who once uh, was part in the last days. Again, thank you as well to the panelists and to Wiener Zeitung for streaming. Uh, excuse me for some small technical problems. I think it was still possible to engage and to be with us. So, and now we will have another possibility to see and reflect on what we are doing in a different way, in a different way, not talking, a performance. So please.
Thank you very much.